again, uh, it's going to be experiential. Uh, you, this is not a model of therapy. You can use it of any therapy that you're already doing. Uh, you know, so it's not like saying do this. It's just some good ideas to work with clients. Way. Um, so again, life. I'll just start. Life is full of many authentic experiences that can that bring opportunities for us to grow. And, uh, and I think it's really important that we, we have a lot of good stuff that happens to us, but we don't know how to grow the good inside of, inside of us. I'm, her, I'm sure over the years you've heard me talk about the negativity bias that exists in our brain. That yeah. We're really good at holding on to the bad stuff uh, because of just the way our DNA is set up for thousands of years. Uh, we had to watch out for lions and tigers and invading armies, just bad stuff happening. So the people that survived all this bad stuff, you know, uh, had a negativity bias for bad things to occur. The people that were the hippies of, you know, 4,000, 5,000 years ago didn't survive. They got eaten alive. So we have a real good negativity bias. We don't have a good positivity bias, and we can't even develop because it's so deeply ingrained. What we can do is develop what we would call a positivity counterpoint to learn to notice about the good the, the good stuff that's going on and begin to just take it in and make it more deeper, more part of who we are in this way. And if we can learn to hold on to the good, we can learn to stay more open. Again, taking the good, not just mentally, wow, that was good, but to take it in from, from, uh, you know, from an enriching point of view to absorbing it deeply into our body, that we can stay open we can be more react, we can be, we can receive it, we can be responsive to it, and, and we can and we can take in that good feeling and make it a more part of who we are. It's not about taking away bad stuff, it's not about minimizing it, it's just adding that we can hold some some good a lot of good stuff in this way. Um, so I just want to start out with telling a little bit of a story, okay? Um, uh, I had I had very loving parents very loving, very caring, very caring parents. They did a lot of stuff for me. Um, they cared a lot in this way. They really did. They were, they were both Holocaust survivors. Uh, my father was the oldest of 10 children. He lost everyone. But before that, he was uh, born to a Hungarian family that was Hasidic. He was the oldest. So he had to serve in the Hungarian army. Uh, and they were extremely Hasidic, uh, Satmar. His father learned. Everyone below him either was learning or doing the Hasidic stuff. He had to go out, of, uh, go out of work. He had to go out and join the army in this way, you know. And when the war came, he was in his you know, in his mid twenties. He knew the countryside. And he was able to keep the family and a number of people, a number of other families, hidden in the woods for a long time almost like that defiance movie was really true for him in this way. And when they couldn't do it anymore, they turned themselves in. And as a result, they lost all their family. My mother had a, a little bit of a similar story. She was also brought up in the same town. Um, she was one of five children, but the only one to survive before the war, all the children died early in childbirth. And the thinking at that time was, is that her parents were cursed and they removed her and put her into another family. So she had a difficult childhood. A lot of bad stuff happened in this way, also went through the Holocaust. And as a result of their experience, uh, they came out with, uh, again, they were not gonna lose anybody else. So they did a lot of good things. They were extremely loving, uh, extremely do, just doing a lot of stuff, making sure about the stuff, but they didn't know empathy. They didn't know atonement. They, just there wasn't in them. And I look, I got it in the sense it took me many years that they were not going to lose anybody else. So they did their best to do stuff. I'm using the word to do stuff to hold on. They really lacked an, an empathy. So for me, you know, uh, growing up was like breathing air through a straw. I just could not get enough of that empathy, that, that caring, a lot of doing. I was bullied in school, uh, especially in the sixth grade. And I came home in tears. I was going to public school at that time. Uh, tears being picked on, not just by the students in class, but almost encouraged by the teacher that probably had her own issues. Because uh, in terms of their doing, my father worked very hard coming to the States. 
and he was relatively successful, he was able to buy a house in a very middle class area. Uh, didn't know that much about Jews, and we were not that religious. And so coming in as a Jew, I was just a victim to be picked up and encouraged by the teacher. And I came home and uh, the kids are calling me names, being mean to me, no one wanted to be my friend. This was not just one year, but six years of school and in kindergarten in this way. Um, and I came home in tears and my parents did a dutiful thing. You know, I dressed funny because my parents were greenhorns, old world. I just didn't dress like anybody else in the screen. They took me to the fanciest clothing store and bought me brand new clothes. And I still came with the school miserable. And I went to them and they just couldn't understand why is this bothering me so much? I have the clothes, I have this. So it was difficult when you're a little kid and then these things go on, you really struggle with what's wrong with me. I have the clothes and they're still saying, what's wrong? Why can't you be happy? What are you spoiled and all this kind of stuff. But again, they were extremely loving, extremely caring, but they didn't have the empathy, the caring to say, gosh, it must be so hard. People calling you names it must be so difficult. Your teacher not being nice. They went to fix and solve the problems. They bypassed the empathy. So life was really, really, really hard in this way. Uh, you know, so again, I had different parents not being included, not being left out. I had a lot of negativity bias in this way. You know, um, it wasn't the absence of the good. It was just, I couldn't notice them because there's so many bad things happening around me. I'd pay attention. There's a lot of good stuff going on. And it was not until, and I'll probably go share the story again at some other point. I had you know, gotten by, you know, gotten by, uh, you know, high school, became religious, went to college, went to graduate school, got married, had some kids along the way. You know, and life was okay, but I just felt I was missing something. Uh, my first job after finishing graduate school, um, I went to work at a clinic. Again, had this funny feeling about myself inside this felt sense. And I went to work the first day and um, I'm sitting down, lunchtime came. And it was a clinic we had about, there's about 10, 12 people on the staff. And uh, everyone stopped for lunch at 12 o'clock. I sat in my office, closed my door, took out my lunch and started eating. And the clinic director knocked on my door and said, join us for lunch. We, all, we want you to have lunch and we all eat lunch together. And it was like I had woken up for the first time. And I began to realize that people can like me. They can relate for who I am. And it got, you know, again, you know, it was gone over and gone over and gone over, deeply embedded in me as I continued working that the people like me for who I am, for what I did, how I did it. They like me as a person. And I found out, you know, uh, working in this field that more and more people like me in my bag of bones and that felt good. I was even valued by some people in this way. And when I continued through my work in the States, coming to Israel, people like Lena in this way, really, you know, make a difference in terms of, they really do like me. They even listen to what I have to say. Wow, it was a wonderful feeling. So that sort of woke me up to realize that there's a lot of good stuff that happens out there, but we have to learn to hold it. That people can just say, hey, join us for lunch. And notice what that feels like, that feeling. They really do like me. It's a really good feeling. And just building on that in some ways. You know, and maybe that led me to the nature of my work in terms of focusing on health and resilience and how people bounce back rather than diagnosis. But it, it was really important in this way. So what it really got to, what really got me to understand my life in some ways is, is, is that there are good things that happen. There are good facts. And we have to notice them and hold on to them. Almost like if you're hungry, make sure you bring your own spoon so, so you can eat enough. But it also made me realize that momentary states can be really good of happiness. And it's our job to make those momentary states into lasting traits in this way. So uh, that's sort of like why, why this interests me. How can we make these good experiences last longer? Not only for ourselves as people, but even our clients who are coming, coming in and they're feeling deficient, not as good as something is missing in this way. So if you look at your handouts, there's a thing called what, what, you know, what, we, what we want to do here. We're only going to do the essence of positive neuroplasticity. 
We'll do number two, having an enriching uh, and absorbing experience. And the third one will be linking, what will be linking a positive and negative material together. And you can do this with clients. It doesn't solve problems. It doesn't fix problems, but allows your clients to show, show up to their difficulties more open and with more resilience to bounce back. And it's not so overwhelming. And we'll probably we'll do that uh, on the second day. So again, we're learning how to deliberately internalize beneficial experiences that have happened every single day. Um, recently, I broke my shoulder and I was, I'm not in the sling today, but um, I was in a sling for about uh, two, three months because I broke two bones there. And it felt so good when I was going into a grocery store and doing the shopping that people would unload my shop, my shopping cart, would pack it up for me, would ask if I needed help. One person walked me to my car and loaded my trunk with the groceries and things like this. And I would just peg and there's a good feeling that people really do care and learning to hold it becomes really important. Our clients are coming in with a whole list of bad stuff that's happened. And when something nice happens to stop, you know, they say in mindfulness to pause and ponder, just to pause and think about it. that really does feel good and learn to hold it. That's a valuable resource that we could teach ourselves, we could teach our clients, we can teach our families to be able to deliberately internalize a beneficial experience. And we have a lot of them during the course of the day. And I'll give you some ideas, some practices that you could use in terms of making a difference for you. Okay. And again, once you can internalize these skills, these good feelings to cultivate what would be beneficial in your mind to have, what would that be like in your mind? And then finding different ways to encourage these beneficial experiences. Okay. Um, uh, again, the next slide talks about challenges and resources. Our lives are full of, continually full of challenges and we have resources to deal with them in this way. And again, we, can, we tend to overestimate the challenges that we have in our lives and we tend to underestimate the resources that we do have in this way. We, you know, we see clearly the challenges, but resources exist in the world also and we can learn to take them in. You know, we can learn to take them in. Resources and challenges exist in the world, they exist in our body, they exist in our mind in this way. And again, just sitting here, we can think of the challenges that we have, you know, every day in our lives. If you think of the challenges in, in your life experience, again, if you think of challenges that we have in the world, it might be your work environment. That might be a challenge to you. You might be working in a crowded office, there might not be enough heat. Again, these are challenges. I'm not talking resources yet. We'll get to that later. It could be the people that you're working, the hours. It could be the work environment. There might be, you know, uh, you know, not enough heat in the winter, not enough, not, not enough air conditioning in the summer. There might be, you know, if you're working in a factory, the toxic fumes. It could be the amount of tasks. You know, we're sitting at a table in a chair, and maybe the task might be holding people's problems. But some people were just doing difficult physical jobs that might be in stressful situations. I'm sure a lot of all of us have stressful situations that come up in our work. People with difficulties, people with overwhelming problems. Problems in the world can be in our family. It could be in-laws. It could be illnesses that people have that we love. It could be a single parent. It could be dealing with teenage children. It could be relationship. It could be, in my case, being bullied. I mean, you might have legal problems, financial problems, problems with the weather. Last week it rained a lot and you forgot your raincoat at home. Living in the Middle East, the threat of war, the threat of terrorism. These are all challenges that we face in the world. And there's many more of them, okay? The challenges that we have in our body is really our health. You know, we're getting older. You know, my body is sagging with the gravity. Uh, chronic pain, I broke my shoulder, it hurts, you know, just the wear and tear in our bodies as we get older. Dysfunctions that things are not working, we may have stomach problems, trauma might be us problems that we have. Again, you know, our body is, again, I'd say faces challenges. And if you think about it, how we treat our body, okay, how we treat our body, you know, is how we treat ourselves. When we really care about ourselves and really attuned to us, we treat our body well. We may exercise, we may eat properly, 
we may eat on time. Uh, we may say uh, that we're going to have our meals slowly and not in between clients or with clients. How we eat our meals, who we eat our meals with in this way. Our mind, again, is a challenge. Our temperament, are we anxious? Are we sensitive? Are we prickly? Are we picky? Are we blue all the time? Again, life experiences create our challenges. But, you know, they're interrelated in some ways. But we could, you know, we could have tendencies towards addictions. We could have tendencies that I just have to feel good. Our mind creates challenges for ourselves. So again, how we show up to our challenges and our resources become really, really important. You know, we could be temperamental. We can be melancholy. We can be easily irritated in this way. We could feel inadequate or we can feel small. We could have cravings, you know, whatever it might, might be. Okay, but as our challenges, and they're going to increase, not because we have problems, just we have more kids. We have, instead of just kids, we have grandkids, we have adult children. You know, I'd like to say that it's the hardest thing to raise is adult children. Uh, kids are kind of easy. They listen to adult kids are difficult to raise. But the challenges that we have, and as we increase our challenges, we need to increase our resources. Um, in this way, we need to be, as we become more vulnerable, we need to increase our reasons to how we show up to life in this way. And you know, a therapeutic challenge might be, how do we help people increase their resources? If you think about it, you know, look, we live in a pretty healthy country, a resource, we have healthcare easily accessed, maybe not the greatest, maybe not the quick, quickest, but easily accessed healthcare. Most of us have loving, caring uh, connections to people. We, you know, we, have, we have mental resources. We have, we, have, we have a lot of good stuff that can happen, happen to us. We have skills. We could ride a bike. We can drive a car. We, can, we, we went to school. Uh, we can learn how to play an instrument. These are resources that we never even take in in this way. You know, you know, you, know, you might think about it like driving a car, riding a bike. They're, they're resources, able to finish graduate school, able to work with people. They're resources that we just don't, hey, hey I did this in this way. It becomes really, really important. It could be psychological resources like grit, fortitude, gratitude, resilience, uh, determinations, you know, uh, the resources in the world, having a stop sign on the street that traffic is not running out of control, that we have a healthcare system that's trying to reach us. We had COVID shots. I forgot to mention the challenges and challenges. We had COVID that we all survived. That might be a resource. We survived COVID. I don't know. We have hardiness in this way. We need to get enough sleep. We need to get enough exercises to exercise, to sleep. And, you know, getting enough sleep is really important. Uh, again, real, re realizing our fundamental goodness as people, you know, um, like I said, well, it's nice when people help me out. That felt good. And I'm sure for the people who helped me out, it's a double-edged reward. They felt good helping me. And I felt good receiving their help in this way. You know, and, uh, you know, so it, there's a nice exchange there. You know, we have our fundamental goodness, our virtues, our honesty, our fairness, our patience, our desire for justice, that we care about people, that we're concerned about people. You know, everyone that's in this room has a concern for people. I always tell people, if you can't went into this profession to do this for the money, you need to be sitting on the other side of the room because you're not going to make all that much money doing this. But we have a fundamental desire to be helpful, caring, concerned, wanting to be of service to the people around us in this way. It becomes really, 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 really important stuff, you know, so... Uh, it makes it it makes a difference so we do have resources we're going to do an exercise about finding the good facts in your life and i'll walk you through it in this way so again uh taking in the good okay is taking a momentary experience a good experience and making it hardwired into your brain this takes a little bit more work than we're going to do here it's not that hard but uh, you know you can do it but letting it sink in and develop inside your nervous system that you could pay attention where you could take that good state that this really feel, you know that i can take that good state it's nice when people help me out it's nice when people you know let me cut in front of the line because i could really do that oh my God. i can i can anticipate pain pretty good 
they let me cut in front, that it feels good. And learn to uh, instill and absorb that feeling, enrich and absorb that feeling to make it stronger and stronger. And I could change a momentary good state to a trait that it uh, of that good feeling. I had a warm sensation. It felt good when people take care of me. And I can make a neural pathway of that in our brain. We can do that in this way. So how do you take in the good? Again, this is a concept developed by Rick Hansen. It's, it, it's an acronym called HEAL. That's in your handout. It's having a beneficial experience to have one. And it's good to have one. Like I said, I had a beneficial experience. Just someone saying, join us for lunch. We all eat lunch together. And I had when I worked at four or five years of lunch, of four or five years of having lunch every day with these people. And we enjoyed each other company and they enjoyed me. They got to know me better. So it starts with an experience and you need to have the experience of it, not the thought. It wouldn't have been, I'm sitting in my room with the door closed and eating my sandwich. Gosh, it would be nice if they invited me to lunch, but it's actually having the experience of it, having a good experience. I could think it'd be nice for people when I'm in line. So it'd be nice if they pack my groceries, but actually have them do it. And one person came with me to my car and opened this, give me the key, put the stuff in my, you know, it was really that important. So it's activation of it. The H is having a good experience. The E is installing the experience in your mind, making it big, not just say, well, that was really big, but you can, you can certainly make it big and that felt good, that really felt good. But it might be other times that you had experience of people being helpful to you, people being kind to you. So you wanna install it really, really big up here in the brain, okay? And then the A, the absorbing part of HEAL is absorbing it deeply into your body, getting a body sense of what that, feels like that warm caring it's such a warm because i could feel it all over my body and again it's making it deeper and richer deeper and richer you want to become receptive to that good experience you want to make it stronger and deeper in the party and the last one which we'll do next time which i think again it, this is not part of heal but it's the l is linking it to and i think maybe some people find this val valuable linking it to a positive, linking the linking this to a negative experience, this good experience, and see how it shows up. Okay, again, and part of linking is again being aware of a bad event in spacious awareness that it's a that it does happen, but there's a lot of stuff that's going on, and it challenges the negative thoughts that we have about our behavior, and we realize that you know that we don't have to be stuck with these old stories that we have about ourselves in this way. Okay, any questions so far? We're good? Okay, that's great. Go ahead, Rachel. Um, I see your finger. So, okay, cool. Um, I just had a question, what you were talking about, the link thing, I didn't understand what you said. If we're linking it to a negative experience, are we like, are we sort of um, mirroring it against the positive experience? What's the point I'll, of linking I'll tell you, I'll tell you what it's, it's it, it, okay, I'm gonna do it the next day, but I'll tell you what it is. Well, if you want to use it, let's say in a clinical way, you might have a client that is thinking of something that's uh, against, it's thinking of something that's really having a difficult time with. And you say, think of a difficulty you might have. And we're going to do this in, in an exercise. Let's say, uh, uh, Adam didn't give me a kiss goodbye today. And I'm really, really, really upset that he didn't give me a kiss that goodbye. That would never happen. That would never happen. Okay. It really hurts. Okay. And I would, and they would say, just push it to the left side of your brain, to your right and your back of your brain, and then have an experience. It could be where Adam was very loving to you. It could be something else and bring it and bring it. And then I'm doing it quickly. So it's not as quick as this. And then you say, okay, bring this, this in spacious awareness, bring this bad, bad experience to the forefront of your brain and gently have it lean in to this good experience. Okay. Okay. Not to push it away not to break it, but just lean into it gently, okay? And as you're leaning into it, you may have cracks in this bad experience and have a good experience, slowly fill those cracks. And what, what tends to happen is it just shows up softer and more gently, but I want you to experience it, so we'll, we'll do it together. But that's the L of linking. You're linking the bad experience to a good experience in this way. So, so quickly, like like a client might say, somebody said something obnoxious to me, and then you try to see situations where that person acted different, or or where people said nice things. You, you could you could do that, or it could be it could be whatever you want it to be. It could be that direct. I'm not saying it can't be, 
but it could be someone come in and say, gosh, I'm just, life is so hard with COVID. And you would want them to, again, enrich it, absorb it, and think how hard it is, put it to the side, and just say, think about, uh, Lena brought me a cup of coffee that I like today. And it was really nice, and I really felt good that she was so kind to it. And just hold that experience of someone taking care of you, thinking of you, bring a cup of coffee other times, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So it's experiential. Then, it's something that it's, it's not something uh, that you, you can't get. Yeah, all of it is experiential because okay. you want to you want to teach yourself, you want to teach your clients these skills that okay. they can go home and they can say, hey, if you know, if I had a bet, my kid was a pill this morning, getting out of school this morning. And you might, if you want to use your example, and I can sit down to this cup of coffee, everyone is going, I can really enjoy it, you know, and you can do it that way. It does not take away the bed, but it allows us, it's not all encompassing, and we can be with it a little bit softer, okay? Any other questions in the group here this way? Okay, so uh, again, you want to, uh, so go back to the slides. The goal is, just looking, okay, yeah. The goal is, again, where, if you look at that picture, having a beneficial experience, if you see that bottle there as being your soul or your somatic self, whatever term you want to use, we have a difficult time letting the good in. We're really good at letting the bad in. So when, when we enrich it, bring it up into our, our mind, we're letting it in, okay? And again, it's just not saying, okay, you know, uh, Lena brought me a cup of coffee. I might say, yeah, it's really nice she did that. She really does care about me. That's really good. But I might think about, well, you know, that was nice 40 years ago when I was asked to, to join for lunch, you know. Uh, and I think of other times of people that acts of kindness towards me in some ways and enrich it, okay? And then absorbing it, making it deeper and deeper in your soul, okay, in this way. And then the linking would be, Again, if you see the three balls there, the little ball, which be the bad experience, gets taken up and it becomes bigger with at the end in some ways. It's just an experience. But the whole notion is to have and enjoy. Enjoy all the good stuff, enjoy all the bad stuff, but we can hold all the experience at once in this way. So if you see the slide, let's try it. Do you see that slide coming up? If you have the slides with you? And it says, okay, so I'm just gonna help you uh, notice a little bit. Let's take, think about something, okay? The first one, notice something beneficial in your awareness right now, okay? You know, uh, it might be, I'll use Rachel, I'm sitting next to Adam right now. That's, you know, and just that beneficial. I'm not asking you to lie. Hopefully it's beneficial, but uh, <laughs> something that's beneficial. It might be, hey, I like learning with people. It might be beneficial that, hey, my chair is working well, it's not breaking. It might be the light fixture is going, it could be that simple, but something that's beneficial in your awareness right now, it might be I like attending uh, classes by, you know, at, you know at, at the place. It might be you're sitting, if you were sitting at the place and maybe that'll happen sometime before we get into the thirties of, uh, of the 21st century, I don't know. And you might say, gosh, I really enjoy the people that are around. Something that's beneficial in your awareness. It might be I see uh, 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 Chinese, so I say, my kids are quiet. Wow. Uh, and let me just enjoy the peace, you know, in this way. So just notice, we're going to just try a little exercise right now, okay? Notice something that's beneficial. I'm going to do it with you. I'll just prompt you through it if you don't mind. And this is something you can do with, with, with your clients who might be, again, it's, it's a practice. It doesn't get rid of problems. But again, notice that something beneficial in your environment now. For me, what's going on is that I have about uh, 10 people listening to my propaganda. That's a good feeling. You know, just bring the people actually listen to me. You know, just bring in, you know, just bring in something beneficial. Okay, and you want to reach it in the brain. So I might be thinking about the other times that I've spoken at the place. And what it's like that people actually hear me. It's a good feeling. People really listen to me. They think I'm smart. Wow. Not letting the negativity bias flow in there, but they, you know, might think of other times I've spoken. I'm going back really in times to times that I spoke about different topics that were really well received and how good that felt. 
I remember speaking in Israel at uh, Shari Tzedek Hospital in November of 2007, attended by a lot of people. And they really liked what I had to say. And I get a lot of feelings of smiles in my belly as I absorb it. It's nice when people like what I have to say. That kind of kindness is really nice also. Some people even laughed at my jokes. That's a good feeling too. Some people will come up and ask me questions and that feels nice, makes me feel important. When they pay attention, it's nice too. It's a good feeling. And just, again, have the beneficial experience that's happening right now, sitting here with us together. Enrich it in your mind. Absorb it. And we'll just do it for another minute or so. And just try to notice what it's like to absorb a beneficial experience in the sense of what I was feeling right before and what I'm feeling now. Is there any difference? I'm a, I a little bit softer. I'm a little bit more open. I'm more receptive. Didn't change anything, any difficulty that you were having before you walked in at two o'clock, but how are we showing up to it is different. Not about solving, it's not about fixing, but how we show up to things becomes really crucial. So just hold it for another 15 to 30 seconds. And if anyone would like to share what that was like in terms of taking the time to notice a beneficial experience. What is that like? Again, it's not going to fix any problems, but if there was any changes that you, you went through. Does anyone want to share what their experience was like or? Sanford, I mean, I always feel like when I do things, let me. Yeah. Uh, that, um, that, that it, 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 you know, you can really change your attitude when you start. I mean, again, it, it, we do this in a, a lot of program stuff. It's just, okay. you know, attitude of gratitude. Right. You know, it's, right. it's not necessarily neuroplasticity. That's what we call it. But it's concentrating and trying to change the thought process from all the negative and going down the rabbit holes to things that you can be grateful right. for. For sure. For sure. And, and I, that, I, you know, to me, that, that just changes the focus, you know. Again, for sure. Again, we're, you know, you hit it right on the head, you know, and if you get an AA or, or any program, you know, we're really good at focusing on the negative and changing the focus positive just allows us to, to show up differently. You know, if, 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 you know, if you think about um, recovery, AA, any of the self-help programs, you know, people are walking in the door most of the time at the beginning. And I'm sure, you know, at the beginning and, um, and, you know, they, they may have a whole defensive system built up, but they have a history of you messed up, you know, good, but it have a whole onslaught of stuff that's going on in some ways. And just focusing on, hey, when someone coming up to you after a meeting and saying, hey, do you want to talk? Want to go for a cup of coffee? How much you think, you know, uh, that means to a person? And learning to 
you know, he can say, okay, went out for coffee, but really just to pause and ponder over it. Someone really wants to go with me for a cup of coffee. Someone wants to be my sponsor, you know. Uh, I'll the- go one step further. I think it, 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 you know, when I lecture on 12 step programs, it, the program we teach in, one of the things that I say is from an attachment standpoint, when somebody says, hi, my name is so-and-so and I'm in, you know, whatever, an addict, a sex addict, whatever. Uh, and everybody right. says, hello, so-and-so. That could be like the first attachment, real attachment, you know, experience someone has. I mean, it, that's, I think, again, I don't think they did, they, they did it thinking because it was way before Bowlby and Ainsworth. But right. that's what that is. That's right, for that's sure. That for is. sure. For sure. But, you know, again, you, you're, you're using it in terms of AA, which I think one of the, the biggest gift, and I'm not minimizing it, is that you walk into a group of people that are really interested in caring about you. And that could be a remarkable experience for someone. When someone walks into your office, you know, and you sit down and you start talking, how can I be helpful to you? You know, and you become interested in caring to them. That's a person that, that, that someone is, is not looking to condemn them, but be with them. It's a big experience. And noticing in that awareness that I can be in this environment here. When I walk into Lena's office or your office or Botch's office and so they really care is really important. It's really important, you know, in, in this way, you know, and you'll get your people, you know, who personalize, well, you're doing this for the money and things like this, but behind it, you really do care. And they pick up that caring part, which is, which is really important. But again, you, you're correct. Noticing a beneficial experience, bring it to awareness, it softens us, opens us up, say, what else can we be doing this way? We can feel it's really important in this way. So, you know, uh, Rachel, you have, you have a question? Just a, quick, a quick thing. So my son found somebody's wallet in America and mm-hmm. he decided to return it. And I guess in the area he was in, like nobody had ever like done that. I guess like everyone was shocked by the whole thing. And even mm-hmm. this woman who we returned it to said, I didn't know there were good people left in the world. Okay. So you talk about a negative <laughs> to positivity switch. Okay. Like they, she honestly didn't even hop. There were people who would care enough about her to return a wallet. I, I would go. I would go a little bit different. It's true. I go. How good did your son feel when those words entered his ears? Yeah. Right. Well, he definitely told everybody. You know, it feels good. I, you know, in this way. But again, the. It's, it's important, but again, hopefully there's a softening of what's going on with people opening up. And again, if you, if you think about what we're doing, we want people to soften in the room, to open up the possibility. We don't have them like this in this way. So again, again, I'm, I'm not saying this is it. I think when, you know, I'm, I'm, I use a therapeutic relationship, uh, just sitting with the client and you can, you know, who's coming in and, you know, just say, before we leave, just notice something beneficial that they, you know, something good that's happening here, you know, and it could be the chairs don't work. You're not charging all that much money. Who knows? Uh, but something that's beneficial, you know, you were kind to me and just having them bringing it in and making it deeper. They're, they're softening up. So it could be some of the clients can, can leave the room with, you know, once a day, do this. I'm not trying to direct you to do this in some way, but like I said, it, it's a different way. As Gershon said, they want to guess of AA is that people say, hey, you want to go for a cup of coffee? Call me if you need something in this way. You know, so it's important. Again, we can create beneficial experiences. We can begin to, you know, again, create them. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. And uh, in terms of, you know, we can break, we can do, uh, let me take that back. I'll do it right now. We can teach people to experience gladness. You know, people write gratitude lists. These are all creating beneficial experiences, you know, and then, you know, create the experience of feeling cared about, you know, uh, and it's really important. I think Gershon, get, and, and I think Gershon mentioned people coming into room and there's a group of people that care about you. They really like me as such, you know, j- just, just from, let, let's just do something here. I really want you to, with your feet on the floor, just say with, with conviction, say they to yourself, Imagine some people that you know in the world and just say to yourself, they really like me. They really do like me. And just notice how that feels. It's a very gentle, carry feeling. We don't, we don't value that, but it's really something we need to do, you know, in this way. You know, uh, Rachel gave the example of her son that, hey, people really value me, what I did. Wow. And take it in 
from here to here, it becomes really powerful. Unfortunately, that's a state and not a trait. But if you can learn to make that passing state of people really like me into a trait, how much differently we can show up to all the stuff that comes up in the world in this way, okay? So what we're talking about is uh, growing inner strengths in this way. How do, and what I'm really saying is how do you grow resources it becomes really, really important. We're gonna be doing that next. But there's a story, uh, it's a, you know, it's, a, it's an American Indian story of these group of children you know, sitting with their grandmother in a tent out in the plains of, of the West. And uh, they go to their grandmother. How did you, how did you learn to be so kind? Grandma, how did you learn to be so wise? How did you learn to be so loving? And they were interested because she was loving, kind, wise. How did you be so caring? How did you learn to be so caring to us? And she said, you know, I realized in my heart, there are two wolves. One of the wolves is love, and the other, uh, other one is, is hate. And I realized very early that, my, that what it, my, my ability to do all these things was dependent on which wolf I choose to feed this day, you know? And what wolf do we choose to feed every day for ourselves? We can do hate, we can do, or we can do love and caring in this way. And we can build inner strengths that way. So again, our inner strengths are our understanding of the world, our capabilities, our resources. Again, we're talking about resources, driving a car, talking to people. That's an inner strength that people can come to and talk. I can help them. I can really help them. Uh, a positive emotions, happiness, uh, laughter, joy, uh, you know, all these positive emotions are really inner resources. And if we can build them, our attitudes around creativity and curiosity, our open-mindedness, our bravery, our persistence, these are all our attitudes that we have, you know, that we can build on and make them bigger and bigger. Our motivations, what, what gets us moving, what we enjoy doing, what gets us exciting in this way. Our virtues, our integrity, our, our social intelligence, our ability for, uh, for, for, for fairness, citizenship, loyalty, leadership, prudence, modesty. We have all these things that we can build on and notice. What, we are, what we're good at noticing are when we're not strength, what we don't do well, and we go on and on and on. So from this notion of building inner strengths, okay, inner strengths are built from the way we think about things and our brain structure. Everyone's, everyone has heard these next quotes, but I think they're really important. Repeated mental activity entails repeated neural activity. The more that we think about our resources, the more that we think about our strengths, the more that we think about the goodness and gifts that we have, repeated mental activity about these cells leads to increased neural activity about ourselves. Again, we experience it in our mind, we bring it down to our body and there's an, the elevator is going up and down between our in skull brain and our somatic brain and repeated neural activity builds new neural structures. And as Thomas Webb said, and this is back in 1947 or 49, the exact date's not popping, but I know it's 47. I said, this is a phrase that everyone knows, neurons that fire together, wire together, that we can reshape our brain into uh, again, to make a neural pathway of any one of these inner strengths, resources, whatever you want to call them in this way, it becomes really, really, really important. You know, you know, the exercise that's really famous is, you know, taking in the good. Think of a good experience, hold it, you know, think about it, feel it deeply in here, pay attention to it, hold the feeling for 30 seconds, doing it six times a day, the same experience, after 30 days, you will have a new neural network of that experience in this way. Doesn't take away any of the bad. This is not replacing the bad with the good, just changing the shape of our brain. And at the University of uh, Wisconsin in Madison, where they do all this brain research and this neuroplasticity stuff, 
that brain actually will change shape after 30 days. And we have developed a new neural pathway in the brain. So it's an addition to, not instead of, which is really, which is really important. It's not to get to take away the problem, but how can we be with it with more resources? How can we be with these challenges with more resources to show up to them in, 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 in a way? So if you think of that notion that neurons that fire together, wire together, it's we're really learning to change our brain in our neural structure. And it's a two stage thing. One is to recognize it, encode it. This is, uh, this is happiness. This is joy. I'm just, okay. Consolidate it, making it more a part of yourself. You need to activate it by saying, gosh, when, uh, when, 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 when Lena says, good job, that feels so good for me, but to learn to install, to make it a part of myself, I just don't need Lena to say good job and it goes away. It becomes more and more a part of who I am. And we're learning to turn, learning to, I'll get my mouth right. Learning to, learning to turn a state into a trait becomes really, really, really powerful. So learning uh, takes place in two stages be it encoding to consolidation, activation to installation, state to trait. It really takes effort, and but if you do it, it'll become part of you. Uh, I think it's, oh boy, oh boy, this, uh, I've got his first name, Eckert in uh, North Carolina, who does the you know, consolidation, reconsolidation of the brain. He says he has a learning model. If you think about it, most of the time we go through life with unconscious competence. Things just happen. We don't know why it just does. If we learn to pause and ponder, we go to the next stage of learning, which is consciously recognizing joy, but we're incompetent. We don't know how to keep it going. As we keep on practicing, we become conscious and we become competent. That, hey, if I, if I notice joy, I can feel it in my body and I'm pretty good at it. But the fourth stage is the most important. We become unconscious competent that we don't even have to think about it it just becomes part of who we are joy is who we become in some ways so you want to go from unconscious incompetent to conscious to conscious incompetent to conscious competence to unconscious competence so it's really important stuff to, to get along the way again i get our inner strengths are grown from our experiences as they occur to stop and pay attention we don't stop and pay that attention one of the beauties of mindfulness, and I love the phrase, is to pause and ponder. Just stop and say, wow, that feels good. Not that we have to sit there under a tree and notice, but just say, yeah, that feels good. We begin to make conscious incompetent. And as we sp spend more time, it becomes part of who we are in this way. So we learn to take, we learn to take activated states or experience that activate states that we like more of and we can make and we can install them into traits again but i think it's really important because people get uh confused in the sense of if i do this i'll have less of this bad stuff so not uh the, you know the good news is you'll have more of this good stuff but you'll still have the bad stuff that's coming along for the ride but i could be with it in a different way you know so again as we as we become more compassionate by repeated ex installing experience of, of compassion we can become more compassionate if, if we become more grateful by repeatedly installing experience of gratitude, we become more grateful. And again, the more mindful you are, the more you pay attention to pause and ponder, the more mindful we'll become in this way. And again, most experience of inner strengths, resilience, insight, and mindfulness and self-worth are enjoyable. They really are. But we just don't take the time to do it, okay? And again, without installation, making it a part of who we are, okay? Without it become passing mental states, which feel good, you know what I mean, in this way. And there's no learning, there's no changing in the brain in any way. So activation without installation is pleasant, but has no lasting virtue, you know. So I know for myself, when I walked away from my broken shoulder, besides having a lot of pain, which was there no matter how many times people would pack my bags, put them in the trunk, do sorts of really nice things, let me scoot to the front of the line. Uh, it hurt like hell and I went to sleep and it was painful and twisted in a different way. But I could, uh, but it really felt good where I spoke to my wife and said, I ain't giving up the sling so quickly. I'm getting a lot of good stuff happening to me. <laughs> I'm without the sling. I'm not that terrible, but it's really important. Okay. So 
again, so really what, how much time do we spend on beneficial mental states to become part of the neural structure becomes really important. So uh, I want to do a little bit of an ex a little bit of, of, of uh, call it exercise and meditation, whatever, whatever it is, but we'll do this together. Some to the first one, you know, it's called, uh, what are the good facts in your life these days? And it's something that you can do with your clients. Doesn't take away the bad stuff that brought them into treatment, but it gets them to notice that there's a lot of good stuff. You know, uh, I'm sure you know, with the people that you see, we spend a lot of time on a person's problem. Spend a lot of time talking about it, what it's like, when did it start growing up, this and that. We spend very little time on the good facts in their lives. And, you know, when I'm supervising younger, younger people in the field, I have to tell them, you know, when you're doing an assessment, you have to find out, tell me about the best times in your life and become interested in that just as much. You know, because it is important to find out. Tell me about it. how did you do it? What was going on? Not instead of, but it's just a part of them. If you be, see it's important, the client will begin to see it in some ways. So this is really beginning to, you know, begin to notice what are the, you know, the good facts of your life in this way. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to. You muted Sanford. Lena? Somebody muted Sanford. I just did. I might have done it. I, I could be pretty good at that kind of stuff. I could have done that too. I'm really good at that. Okay. So, again, uh, before we start this, I think it's really important to know, and I really spend a lot of time, whatever is bad is true, and what, and also, the good facts in life are true. Okay, it's not to not to say that this is say the bad stuff is not true. The bad stuff is true. It hurts like hell, but the good facts are true. You know, uh, Steve Gilligan has a wonderful quote, and he says, you know, uh, life is wonderful, but sometimes it hurts like hell. Life can be very wonderful, but sometimes it hurts, and we can be with all of that in some ways. It's not one or the other. We need to be with both in some ways. So, if people can, um, if people can just sort of sit sit in their chair, feet on the floor, you can close your eyes and do it. You can write down your responses. I'm just going to give you questions, whatever seems to work, but sort of just be. Get, you know, get in the present moment. The easiest way is maybe breathing in and breathing out. Again, you can close your eyes and do it as sort of like a mindfulness meditation. You can do it as just a bunch of questions that I'm going to be asking you and, and put down your responses, you know, on a sheet of paper, you know, write them down. Okay. So pay attention to breathe in and breathe out. You may want to breathe in love for yourself and then love out to the world. Love for me, love out to the world. You may want to think of a specific person. You may want to say one for me, one out for you. And I said earlier, we experience our challenges and our resources in three places, in the world, the environment, in our body, and in our mind. Okay. And again, these don't have to be big things. They can be little. I'll try to help you make them little as, as they can be. Perhaps even a little of the better. So let's start it with let's start off with the world. Just think, again, the good facts of the people that are in your life right now. Again, the good facts in your life right now. Could be friends. It could be family members. It could be colleagues. It could be people that you're learning their model of therapy about, but you're just happy that they're in your life right now. You don't have to know them, but the fact that they're helping you get your wisdom. 
maybe a pet, maybe spiritual figures. And just the good facts of your life, your work tasks. I have clients, I have a job. I like the work that I do. It really feels good to do that. You might think of technology, computers making your life easier, internet, paying, getting paid by bit might be a good fact. You may begin to think of the fact of, I got water running in my home. I'm not running till well. I'm not pulling up the water. I even have hot and cold water. I can make, I can hit, hit the faucet and have cold water or get nice hot water, take a hot shower, maybe hot water to wash my dishes. I have a heating system in the winter to keep me warm. I may have one of those white things that are on the walls. I may have just a heater in my house, AC, I have air conditioning. I have a refrigerator, I don't have to buy food every day. I can even cook meals for two, three days in a row and keep in the refrigerator, keep food fresh. Don't have to go to the store every day. I'm sure people can think of other things. I have a washing machine, a dryer, electricity to turn on lights, don't have to gather wood for fire. Have a car, get to places kind of easily. Good public transportation here. Don't even have to worry about parking with public transportation. Email, WhatsApp, cell phones. I get stuck, I can call someone up. While I'm on the lake, give someone a message. Good facts in the world. Get paid when I see someone. Cash machines, I don't have to run to the bank. Elevators. I have people to keep me safe on the street. I have police, there's army out there to protect me. Bus drivers, cashiers, people to stock the shelves. Healthcare. I need to get to the doctor, I can get one pretty quick, I guess. Good friends, I'm athletic. Maybe I play an instrument, I play, I'm a good dancer, I ride a bike. Learn to be a therapist, good fact. Still can do my job at 72, or even try to do my job at 72. A lot of good facts in the world, a lot of good facts in the world. Surrounded by a wife who's been with me for 50 years this year. They still need to do a mental health status check on her for staying with me for 50 years. But good fact, I've been pretty lucky. She's not here to testify. Just take some time. Kids, good neighbors, good friends. Just good facts in the world. Jewish neighborhood, Jewish area, living in Israel. And let's go to the good facts in our body. I'm breathing. Lungs are working, breath going in, breath going out. My blood is flowing. My arms are moving. My legs are working. My heart's pumping. 
kidneys are are okay, cleansing. Pretty good health. Pretty good health. Didn't get COVID. Have no major diseases. Some people are recovering from stuff. I'm recovering. I can run fast. I can walk fast. I can lift heavy things. Good facts about our body. A lot of good facts, good health, good blood work. Let's sneak over to the mind a little bit. Think of the good facts, our ability to bounce back, our resilience, our determination, maybe to finish school, not to give up on our professional wants, determination we can do us, our endurance. It's just not getting through, but we are getting through. Our grit, our hardiness. Our interpersonal skills that we can manage ourselves and not losing control. We can treat ourselves kindly and with compassion. We're just not picking fights with people. We can just show up and say, hey, I can be in a relationship with myself and with people. Our ability for wholehearted, this is again our mind, our ability for a wholehearted friendliness, let it be compassionate, to be kind. Our mental resources that allow us to be warm and caring. Maybe even generosity, caring to give back, caring to help out. Our virtues, our moral qualities, not such as fairness, commitment to justice, patience, integrity, restraint. Following the golden rule doing the best we can to follow the golden rule. We may even want to think of our spiritual resources, whatever that might be. But it might be the sense of having a God to pray to. It might be being heard. We tend to, again, overestimate our challenges and underestimate our resources. But we do have this fundamental goodness. We all have fundamental goodness. We have the ability to love and be loved. And that's a fundamental goodness. You know, the multivitamin that we all have is loving. We need that. We'll just take a few more seconds or moments just to pay attention to those feelings. To those good facts. Again, pay attention. What does it feel like? Just take the time to notice the good facts in our life. What was it like to begin to notice? Even the small things. Electricity to turn on lights. Bus is running on time. Bus is running often. Someone to ride the, drive the bus, someone to pick up the garbage, just the small facts. People who can recognize, good job. Just notice what that feels like, the good facts. And again, just as the beginning of having a beneficial experience, Begin to pay attention what it's like to just notice the good facts in your life. The good facts are true just as the bad facts are true. Just noticing the good facts and taking them in. 
paying attention to it, making it the focus of attention. You know, where our mind goes, that's where we go. Where our thoughts go, the mind will follow. If our thoughts go to the good facts, our mind will follow. It doesn't take away the bad, but our mind will follow. How does that have an impact on us? Okay, so that's the, what was it like for anyone doing this exercise at all in some way? Anyone want to share? I um, always find when we do these exercises in one form or another, um, I, I was going to mention that before, that I notice in my body kind of my, my breathing slows down. Okay. My, my sense of being here in the moment increases. And I, I wrote it down because I was, if I just... Okay. Thoughts, they they fly away, which okay. probably would, and and just just that every time you write a word of, of gratitude, even though things always you know whenever so I had a client to ask to do this and she's like this is so cheesy, and I said yeah maybe, but when you do it did you notice something different and she said yeah I, she's highly dysregulated, right. she said. I suddenly begin to feel calmer. Maybe it's not so cheesy after all. Okay. And it has that like effect on us so quickly. Uh, okay. It's amazing. With it was, it's just amazing how quick that happens. And again, I think what you're saying is true. Our breathing does tend to slow down, as we notice, and we pay attention to what's going on. And if you think about being receptive, you think about being green. Our breathing is more regulated more slower, our brain is moving much more slower, and we're open to new ideas, and we're in that window of tolerance, yeah. okay? And again, slowing down the brain, showing up, being more present are, are all crucial facts. Softening mm. in this way, it's no longer fight, flight, or fear. Right, right. Fight, flight, fear, freeze. Oh, there's another one that I'm missing. Fine, fame, 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 death. Okay. Fame, fame. We can show up in the moment. Okay. Any any other questions or thoughts? Go ahead. I felt very expensive. That's for sure. You get bigger. Okay. I I felt so supported by by the universe. Right. Right. And uh, it was very overwhelming that I almost cried. Uh, I don't know if that's good or bad. I'll, I'll ask you, what was that like for you? What is it? What was that like for you? I'm it saying like... it, was, it was so big, it was so expensive that I almost cried, not out of sadness, from joy that um, I, I exist, but right. from my existence. It was right. amazing. It was great. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you, Hagi. You know, uh, that expansiveness that Hagi was talking about is crucial. If we can hold our problems and expansive awareness, they become more manageable. I think they talk about that in DBT, in the sense of creating that environment of expansive awareness. That there's still problems, but they're just more managed. It's just, it's, instead of being like this, it's like this. And it just, there's more resources just to manage it a little bit better in this way. Thank you. Anyone else want to to share what the, the, their experience of it in this way? You have, you have your hand up, Charlie. Did you have your hand up, hand up, or just moving it to the side, or turning off your computer? One of the other. Okay. Any other thought? Any other questions about this in general? In this way. Yeah, so I have a question. Can I, okay, can I, Dove had a question. Who else had a question? Just want to start make sure. Dove, go ahead. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, Sanford, what you felt about uh, uh, the need for relationships <laughs> and if that overrides everything that's been talked about in some way. Because there was a, one of my clients showed me a TED talk, it was very interesting, that said uh, the survey in Harvard or Yale 
over 100, 100 something years. And the most important thing that for long life is um, relationships and community. Um, and let's say, you know, I'm thinking one client in particular, uh, two clients in particular, where the resources of relationships is very, very weak. Um, now, part of it could be because of new oppression or whatever that they, they're, they're, you know, shooting themselves in the foot. But uh, I'm just wondering with all this work and we're happen? not focusing on relationships, then how, how, you know, how upstream are we headed? Okay, it's a good, it's a good question. I actually love the question. So, uh, uh, you know, um, I think re relationships is the crux, crux of our work. I think, uh, I would say probably now, but I know back in like uh, 2010, there were close to, oh, there were over 1400 models of psychotherapy, probably over 2000 now, because a lot of people are in the field, different models, you know, in this way. I think the one, the one constant, and I think it goes back to what Gershwin said at the beginning, is the relationship that we have with our client. I think that's the vehicle of change. What, you know, our presence, okay? Uh, people, it, what makes the difference, what makes the difference is the quality of our relationship to be attuned, engage with the client in being present, not a doing, let's fix this, but how, you know, what is it like to be sitting here with you? Once you have that safety and that presence, then you can bring the other models of psychotherapy in there. So the most important healing aspect of therapy is relationship in, in this way. The relationship makes a difference. After that becomes models in this way. Is that, am, I, am I answering your question? Uh, no, well, uh, I, I, that's so true. And I find obviously in, in, with, with clients and relationship, but if it's one hour in 24 hours a day times seven days a week, um, and they go into not having a good relationship with their wife, not feeling like they fit in with the community, um, uh, feeling abused by, you know, their teachers and uh, friends, um, okay. you know, lonely, okay, uh, you know, so. That, that, that's, that's real stuff. And, and I, like I said, the beauty of uh, Diana Foch's work in ADP really speaks to that. And you know, you're right. How does one hour make, make a difference over the rest of the week? But if you, but in that one, and um, maybe that's the beauty of family therapy in the sense of it's, yeah. it's just not in the hour that you see it, see the person. But what, what I'm trying to say though, is that you're right, you know, one hour a week, but if you could sit with that person, what is it like that you could sit here and you know, to tell me your problem and I can hold it with you? In this time, and there's more to it. I'm, I'm giving you a pretty crummy example, and you might, say, you know, I've never had that before. You know, I feel that you care for me, and then you can get again. That's why I said I, I don't think it's a model of therapy that works. It's knowing as many models as you can and integrating them into your practice. If I'm sitting with someone, let's say I was sitting with you, Dove, and you, you know, and I would say, what is it like to sit here and 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 I get what you're going through, or what is it like that you can tell me about your uh your problem and i'm not leaving i'm not, i'm gonna stay here with you i'm not leaving like your folks did what is that what, what does that bring up for you? you know you have to have a lot of trust and relationship there you know and, and you might you know i don't know what you're gonna say you know in this way but then then i would go to like where else can you get it who else can you get this with where have you ever felt that way before and i'm looking to build that experience where you can feel that safe scene that 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 that, that relation and make myself fair to uh, it's a good question it warns a uh, warns a training in itself okay in, in this yeah. way but i think the relationship is the crucial thing after that's a model of therapy and i think the biggest thing that therapists need to do is find different models to work with that when you come across a client that are in that one hour a week that you can make it the most meaningful for them and look to spread it out to other areas of competence in this way does that make sense what i'm saying to you yeah, yeah so, sure you know Thank you. you know i think and i'll just leave with this point i think sometimes people get married to their model of therapy and they don't get married to the clients i think we need to get married to our clients and have the model fit with the client needs not, not that we get confused, you know. I, 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 I don't watch who I'm saying this to. I, I, I know that. I better not say it. But I've worked with people that they have the true model, 
and that's the only way you can work. I said, I'm Stanford say it. Stanford say it. Don't you can't do this. Like I have a great piece of Lush and Hara, but Okay. Say it. I, there's many IFS people who really hold it as a religion, as a religion, and everything is parts. And I supervise a number of ice people. And I, and I, I said, you cannot use the word part in our supervision. I, don't, I think it's a lovely model of therapy. It's a good model, therapy, but it's it, it's just one of the many. OK, when someone says they have the truth, I know I got to head the other direction. So I'm saying it's a nice therapy, but you can't use can't you, you, you use parts like, you know, in this way. Like I said, I, I almost lost a clinic back in the 80s because I thought solution focused therapy was was the truth. It's a good idea. That's the best it is. And it works for something, not other people in this way. Did that, did that answer your question, Gershaw? Dub, you're talking about Dub, no? Oh, no, but you asked me, you, well, speak to Lush and Horace, so I just did. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, it was good, Stanford. It wasn't as good as I thought it was. wasn't as good as I thought it was going to be, but it was good. Okay. Well, what did you think it was going to be? I don't know, but it, you know, you got me, you got me like excited to like. Not, not that good. Okay. So is it okay if we stop here, Lena? And I'll, I'll, see, I'll see everyone in two weeks, okay? It's nice seeing most of you. Some people sing initials and things like this, but that's okay. <laughs>